It's around 10 p.m. on a stormy Tuesday night, and Gabriel Otrin and Clever Frere are working late at the office, up on the fourth floor. A cleaning lady knocked on our door and let us know that there was a little bit of flooding in the basement uh, level and that people were moving their cars out of the garage. Clever doesn't want his car to get damaged, so both men get in the elevator and start their descent to the parking garage. After a few floors, the elevator stops with a jerk. And we heard a loud splash as the elevator hit the water. It was just like a fire hose was at the bottom of the elevator and the water was just pouring in. Then I think to force the door open is really the only way out. And unfortunately, it's just not possible. We're afraid we might drown. I'm Tora Couture, and this is Tell Me What Happened. True stories of people helping people. An original podcast by OnStar. Every day when you wake up, you don't know if you'll be a person who needs help or if you'll be a person that helps someone else. It's important to remember that it's in all of us to be either one of those things every day. On August 7th, 2018, Clever drove to work and parked in the underground parking garage. He'd founded his own robotics tech startup a few years earlier and rented space in a low-rise building in Toronto, Canada. Gabriel was his first hire. Gabriel was used to working evenings with Clever, but he often ended the day with some work of his own down in the parking garage. I would actually go down there and work on my car for several hours and then go home. So when the custodian warned them about the flood, Gabriel thought he could lend a hand. I was thinking maybe there's like a deep puddle somewhere and I just wanted Clever to at least not drive into it and potentially hydrolock the engine. But he thought that was pretty unlikely. I could foresee, you know, there being maybe a little bit of flooding, let's say near the garage door, but like zero chance of it reaching the doors leading to elevators. Like, it, that, that's impossible. And at night, the elevator was the only way to access the garage. We knew that the door to the parking from the stairs would be locked, so we were not able to get to the basement from the stairwell. What Gabriel and Clever didn't know was that Toronto was in the middle of a massive and unexpected downpour. The media would later call it a ninja storm. Some estimates say parts of Toronto got almost eight inches of rain in just a few hours. Storm drains were overwhelmed, sewer pipes burst, and the city streets flooded. But Clever and Gabriel were so engrossed in work, they didn't notice what was happening outside. When I work, I virtually always have my headphones on, I'm listening to music. And so I probably wouldn't have noticed, you know, uh, if, if it was like a heavy storm and I didn't think all that much of it and just, uh, you know, kept focused on whatever I was working on. Even if they had noticed the storm, they wouldn't have known that the creek beside their building had swollen into a river and drained right into the parking garage. So when they got into the elevator and took it down to the basement, they were surprised when they hit water. You know, it made a pretty loud, like, whoosh noise, a pretty large splash, and, and you felt it. Water started pouring in immediately. At first, Gabriel was annoyed. And I'm like, oh, this sucks. I'm probably going to be stuck here for a while. I don't get my shoes wet. Gabriel jumped on the handrails like he was a cat, keeping himself dry from the water, but I was just letting the water kind of soak me as I was kind of in disbelief, trying to assess the situation. Then he looked around the elevator. And I noticed the outline of Gabriel's cell phone in his pocket. I asked him to take it out and be very careful not to drop it. Clever had forgotten his cell phone at home that morning, so they only had one phone with them. Gabriel tried to get a signal. Nothing. Then Clever snapped into action. I started pressing the elevator buttons for other floors, just trying to get the elevator to move. But the elevator didn't move. They tried to open the door. The elevator door is designed so that if you try to jam your fingers in the crevice between the door and the wall of the elevator, you can't get your fingers around to push anything. It's impossible. 
the water kept rising. It was now almost at their knees. So then I pressed the elevator alarm buttons again and the emergency call buttons. By now, the water is close to the intercom speakerphone. And we're starting to get pretty worried that we're not going to be able to hear anybody, even if anybody does answer. Finally, we hear ringing coming from the speaker. Then what sounds like an on-hold notification, which you can imagine made you a little bit more scared to be put on hold in the middle of the elevator, starting to flood. At this point, the speaker was nearly submerged in water. Then the two men heard a voice. And I begin yelling. Hello, we're stuck on the elevator and water's rushing in. I'm afraid we're going to drown. But as soon as we heard that voice, the water hit the speaker and it cut out. The water was almost waist high. I notice the water is brown. I look around and I see leaves coming into the elevator, floating in the water. Clever couldn't believe what was happening. He thought about where he should have been that night. I remembered that I canceled a movie date with my daughter that was supposed to be for 7 p.m. that night because we were busy with work. And then I started to hear Gabriel praying. And I certainly felt at peace then for either life or death. Gabriel prayed that he and Clever would get out of the elevator alive. I noticed that he made an effort to pronounce my name correctly as if God would not know which person he was talking about. Uh, And in that instance, my worry broke. And this was the first moment that I said to myself, I'm not dying in this disgusting elevator in this brown, mucky water. Then they remembered the hatch on the ceiling of every elevator. Just like you see in movies. And I press on, and I'm like, it's not moving. The hatch was locked and it could be only opened from the outside. I punched it as hard as I could in various different ways, and it started to bend. It bent a bit, but not enough for Clever to even stick the phone through a gap to get a better signal. So Gabriel tried another tactic. He used his head, literally. What I found was actually quite effective was pressing up on it using my head. So I was standing handrails, pressing up on my head, and I I was able to bend it quite far. He managed to open it just to crack. The water was more than halfway up the elevator. Gabriel and Clever were balanced on the handrails, clinging to the walls. Gabriel had a small book in his back pocket. He used it to hold open the hatch. Then Clever positioned the phone near the small opening in the ceiling. I found signal by holding the phone just ahead of the panel where we had cracked it open. Clever dialed 911. And the calls just didn't go through. There just wasn't a sufficient cell signal. A moment later, their phone rang. 911 then called us back and we tried to answer. And the call drops. Clever tried to call his partner. Because we need someone on the outside that will not give up and that knows where we are. So I called. One ring, two rings, three rings, voicemail. But Gabriel and Clever didn't give up. They tried 911 again. And we got a clear voice on the other side. This is Tell Me What Happened, a podcast created by OnStar, to showcase the importance of a human connection when you need help. Whether you're trapped in quicksand, lost in the woods, or treading water in an elevator. Gabriel and Clever were trapped in a rapidly flooding elevator at their office building. The water was more than halfway to the ceiling when they finally got through to 911. But the storm meant emergency service workers were overwhelmed with calls that night. Officers, I know, had to get out of their cars to get into the water to check on cars that had been submerged to make sure there was nobody in it. That's Officer Ryan Barnett. He's been a police officer for over 30 years. The night of the rainstorm, Ryan was working with Officer Josh McSweeney. First time I've ever worked with him. That day, my partner was not in. Josh 
I guess his partner wasn't in, so we just uh, we ended up working together. They heard lots of calls over the radio. Calls about flash floods, cars, and streetcars stuck in water, and people trying to swim their way to safety. After a fairly routine call in their patrol area, they parked to write up their notes. Then a call came in that grabbed their attention. You could tell the dispatcher was a little bit more um, anxious than normal. The dispatcher described the situation. Two people were trapped in an elevator that was quickly filling up with water. She was calling out for any cars to attend in 12 Division because there was nobody clear. Nobody clear. That meant every officer in 12 Division was already on a call. So basically she had nobody to go. And technically, a stuck elevator or a flood is a call that firefighters would answer. But they were also swamped that night. You could feel the dispatcher and the anxiety level. It was getting pretty desperate. Ryan and Josh weren't with 12 Division. They were part of a neighboring police station and didn't patrol or answer calls in that area. But that night, they were only about five minutes away from the call. It was just pure happenstance that we happened to hear the call and be close and were able to jump on it. But they had no idea what they were walking into. We just thought, okay, you know, we'll just show up and we'll wade through the water and we'll open up the elevator and we'll get them out, no problem. Ryan and Josh hit their siren and sped to the office building. I specifically remember we're driving down the street and as soon as I turned, you could see the water had gone all the way up to the back of this building. And I thought, oh my goodness, like this is definitely not something that we would ever expect. The officers got out of their squad car and went in through the front entrance. They ran into members of the cleaning crew who told them how to get to the parking garage. She actually said, you know, the other elevator's working. You could take the other elevator. <laughs> not, not thinking, right? So we kind of looked at each other. We're like, no, we're going to take the stairs. Josh and Ryan entered the stairwell and went down a few steps. The water was almost at the top of the door to the parking garage. We need to do this now. We, we, there's no time to come up with a plan. There's no time to wait. It's, you gotta go. Ryan removed his bulletproof vest and his gun belt. Then he stepped into the water. As I'm going down, I didn't realize how deep the water was. But I'm a, I'm a tall guy, I'm almost six foot four, and I was on my tippy toes just to keep my mouth above the water. Josh stayed behind to keep in contact with the dispatcher in case they needed to call for more help. Ryan waded through the muddy water and made his way to the parking door. He tried to open it. And I can't get over how heavy the door is to open, I guess, because of the water pressure. Ryan eventually pried it open and quickly eyed the elevator in the parking garage. Then he hesitated for a second. It's quite dark in there. And I, I'll be honest, I was worried that when I went in, that the door would shut behind me and lock him in the flooded garage. And I thought, well, I need to make sure I have an escape plan, but I I don't have time to worry about this now. I have to just get these people out of the elevator. At this point, Ryan's feet were no longer touching the floor. He had to swim. I get to the elevators and I could hear them screaming inside and yelling for help. I'm telling them, it's the police. We're here, we're gonna get you out. We're here to save you. By the time we heard the officers inside the door, like, yeah, yeah, we were treading water. We had about a foot of air left. There was an enormous sense of relief, but at the same time, I didn't know how they were going to get the door open. Ryan couldn't pry it open with his hands either. And that's where I became very concerned. I won't lie, it's... You're thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So I yelled to Josh, I said, Josh, I need... I need a crowbar. Josh found a crowbar and Ryan swam to the stairs to get it. And he gives me this crowbar. It's got to be four feet long and 100 pounds, and it's just massive. Ryan swam back to the elevator. He tried to fit the crowbar in between the elevator doors, but it was too big. As I'm doing this, I could hear these two gentlemen in the elevator, and they're saying, please hurry, we're going to drown, we're going to drown, please hurry. 
Ryan yelled to Josh that he needed another crowbar, a smaller one, and fast. Josh found a smaller crowbar and swam over to his partner. Eventually, we get the lip of the crowbar into the door, and I can wedge myself on the doorway and kind of just push it open as hard as I can, and, and it opens. I can feel it open by about an inch. And then all of a sudden, the door started to open. As soon as I felt it start to open and give way, I was like, we're doing this. It's, it's happening. We're, we're getting them out. And the, and the water level was extremely high at that point. It, it was almost at the top of the elevator. And uh, these two gentlemen just come come out of the, the elevator as quick as you can imagine. 40 minutes after Gabriel and Clever stepped into that elevator, the doors opened. All four men swam to the stairs where help was waiting for them. It was surreal. I mean, at the time, we get to the stairs, we get them up. Fire department meets them at the stairs and they're looking after them. Josh and I kind of got up to the top of the stairs and there the, the captain was there and he goes, you guys are amazing. We were kind of just joking about the whole thing because we really don't know how to react to the whole thing. You do what anybody would do. And then when it's all said and done, you kind of just take a step back and you're like, did that just happen? Other than some cuts on their hands from punching the ceiling hatch, Gabriel and Clever were both okay. We're super thankful for to them and their, and, you know, and to their families as well because they were putting themselves into distress for doing this. It was not required of the officers to do anything like that. Josh McSweeney and Ryan Barnett, these are names I won't forget. This was a life-changing experience. If you speak to anybody that knows me, they'll note a drastic change in my behavior and what I found important after that. I mean, spending time with family, with loved ones, self-care, all of a sudden became the top tier things that needed to be done. Things that in being an entrepreneur and building a business um, went by the wayside. Clever told his cousin, a sergeant in the police force, about what happened that night. In speaking to my cousin about what, a, what the police were obliged to do in that scenario, it's like in many cases, many of the officers would not have taken the risk. But these two officers did. Clever's cousin was so impressed, he recommended them for the Star of Courage, an award that recognizes acts of conspicuous courage in circumstances of great peril. They won. I just know that, I don't know if it's fate, a lot of things fell into place for that to happen. I'm not saying that things are written in stone by any means, but there were a lot of stars aligning that night, and I would 100% do it again. A flash flood can turn an everyday situation, like taking an elevator, into a life or death experience. But the reality is you can't control when and where a flood will occur. The only thing you can do is be prepared. Julie Munger is an internationally acclaimed swift water rescue instructor and whitewater professional. She's also the CEO and founder of Sierra Rescue. They provide hands-on training on how to safely navigate fast-moving water to the military, fire departments, river guides, and fishery workers and other interested groups. Julia's experienced the dangers of flash floods, but unlike our story today, her scariest moments happened in the wilderness. The first one was when I was a Grand Canyon River guide, brand new, and the Colorado River flows through the Grand Canyon and has a lot of different drainages that feed into it. And sure enough, we hear the roar of a jet engine coming down the canyon, which is kind of the first sound that you hear. And then the rocks tumbling. So we were able to get up on boulders. But one of the challenges with a flash flood is you don't ever know how much water is actually coming. Um, so we were lucky that day. If Five years later, some of those boulders that we were on actually washed out in a different flash flood. So avoid getting into those sort of situations. How much water came? Like how much did the river rise in that, in that couple of minutes? So in that particular flash flood, it came up about five vertical feet in about 
30 seconds. Holy cow. That sounds, that sounds scary. It's incredibly scary. And it's like a lot of the other flood and water related incidents. It's really about avoiding trouble in the first place. Understanding how water flows and the hard thing about flash floods in general is you don't often know that they're coming because the source of the water is far away. And that's true no matter where you are, whether you're in a city or whether you're in a river canyon. It's the accumulation of water flowing from higher areas to the lower areas. How can we prepare our homes for flash flooding if we do live in one of those at-risk areas? The most important thing to understand is that water is always going to follow the course of least resistance and it's going to fill up and seep into any voids. So putting sandbags around a house is a could be a good way to keep it from flooding. If you know that you are in a flood area, then absolutely I'd say it's worth having a plan the best that you can to divert the water away from your house. And that's going to be trying to make uh, anyth- anything lower than your house. Uh, I live up in a little valley in Northern California, and we use railroad ties and rocks to divert streams away from our house so that it goes around the house and into the meadow. So the same type of philosophy and uh, methods can work in a city as well. The most important thing really is to pay attention to the weather and to know where your house, your particular house is located in that flow of water so that you can leave before it floods. The uh, folks in our story today were in an elevator, which got stuck underground because of a flood. What should you do in that situation? Well, as they, as I'm sure they would tell you, uh, don't get in the elevator. You don't want to go down when it's raining hard or when there's a chance of any type of flooding. A basement, obviously, or an underground parking garage is where water is going to go first. It's going to fill up that space before it starts filling up the building. Um, Water in the basement can affect the electronics of the elevator. So going up, not down, which I understand is a hard decision to make. You want to get to your car, you want to get home, but resist the urge to go down to low spaces when it's raining. Are there common mistakes that people make when driving, um, driving into water on the road? It amazes me still that people will drive their car into a flooded waterway. I mean, six inches of water can lift a car and float the car. When you drive your car into a flooded waterway, you have less traction and you don't have any way of gauging how deep the water is. And then usually it's really hard to judge how fast the current is moving. So the biggest mistake people continue to make is driving into a flooded waterway. Don't do it. Are there lessons that you take from, um, you know, outdoor adventure guiding and, and water safety that can be applied to an urban flood? It's always the humility and being aware and paying attention to the water and just understanding the power of water. I mean, the the force of the water is something that you have to work with and you can't work against. And there's nothing that we can do to stop water when it's flowing in a powerful way. We can't stop it from filling our house. We can't stop it from floating our cars away. All of us, whether it's on a river or in a city, we need to stay out of the water when it's flooding. That's it for this episode of OnStar's Tell Me What Happened, true stories of people helping people. If you want to share your own story about a stranger who showed up for you at just the right moment, look for a link at OnStar.com. Or if you're listening on Spotify, check out the Q&A feature. Let's share some love for people who help others in big ways and small. While you're at it, share some love for this podcast. It really helps if you review and rate us or share this with someone who would enjoy it. On behalf of OnStar, I'm Tora Kachur. Please be safe out there.